I am Bonka Ibiri and the topic I want to talk about today is uh, ethnic identity. What is the difference between ethnic and identity and national identity? You know? Now, ethnic identity is your identity that comes from a natural evolution of events and history. A national identity is an artificial identity that was given to you but because some people came and said okay um, I want to put join this one to this one to this one for administrative purposes now there is nowhere in the world where national identity overrides ethnic identity forget how they always try to make us feel like it's a shameful thing to think that way or you know I want Zeke Lobere Zeke started that nonsense they were saying one nigeria one nigeria and even zig that was doing it he knew the reason why he was doing it because Igbo land Igbo land is a small space for um for Igbos. they need to have an identity of nigeria because look at every Igbo man count 10 wealthy Igbo man all the notable names you know um zig um himself um ojuku all of them, like six of them made their wealth outside Igbo land, either in the north or mostly in our side. So the Nigeria they wanted, the structure they wanted then, it was because it was more favorable for them. The unitary system they were asking for, hoping that they would inherit the estate. But I don't want to go into that because at this point we need to strategize our war, our energy and focus on the real enemy now. Focus on how to attack the real people holding us hostage. At this point, it's not Igbos holding us hostage. I am or Mini or But you see, the the UK that brought um um Nigeria to us, they respected um ethnic identity. That is why the UK respects the rights of the Irish as independent people. The right of um, the Scottish. Now, I don't want to talk about that as well because I want grandson but we want to really elaborate on that. So we don't need to waste time on on that. But if you look at the presidents in America, all the Irish presidents, from Clinton to Kennedy's to the current president, anything, they've never sabotaged their Irish identity. They've always been proud of it, and they've always stood up for Ireland. So anybody, Toban, Sofun, Ipe, you don't have to always reason as a Yoruba person or want to use it to embarrass us they are trying to steal our identity for even the United Nations would not tell us not to think that way the body that structures the world for peace reasons and things like that they respect people's right to their ethnic identity you know my ethnic identity is where my name comes from it is where my culture comes from it is where my thinking comes from it is where my orientation comes from the way I treat elders, the way I approach situations, the way I raise my child, the way I talk, the way I think. So how can you tell me that that is something that is not important? So why should I trade it for something artificial as Nigeria? Now, um, if you ever think of betraying your ethnic identity for a national identity, you are a shameless person, you are a hopeless person. And see, everyone who embraced their ethnic identity, they are remembered today as heroes. Yeah, I want to embrace national identity. We know how their situation is ending. Ojuku is remembered as a hero today. Awolawa is remembered as a hero among his own people. The Sadana is remembered as a hero in the north. He is surely remembered. I mean, if we let's not even go to recent situations, but look at Zeke, look at Obasanjo. Those were not people that embraced their ethnic identity. They embraced Nigeria as a concept. Are they seen as a hero today? I want the Jadin or Jew show where what can that my own back when the when can he carries them and all that. Nobody cares about it because they are fighting for Nigeria. Let Nigeria stand up for them. That's the mindset. Yes, but this is not that's not the same mindset. If people even start to talk about Namdekano. He's their, he's their hero because he's, he's embracing his ethnic identity. He's protecting his ethnic identity. That's not how people think when they, they think of Sunday 
Osha, Chief Sonny Boho, because he is standing up for his ethnic identity, for the preservation of his of his ethnic identity. This should tell you that the natural identity will always supersede the artificial identity. This is not what I. This is just more like a prelude. But the, I'm going to a story, and it's the story of Ogedengbe. What made what really made Ogedengbe a hero? Um, wh why is he celebrated today as one of the greatest legends? It is because of his love for Ijesha. Not that he is just a warrior. Oh, yeah, he was a great warrior and was all that. But what made him outstanding was his diehard love for where he came from. His his obsession for the preservation of Ijesha land. You know, he was born in a city near um, Mifewara, southeast of um, Malaysia. And um, around the early 1800s, right? So he trained to be a warrior in um, Basharun Gumala's private army. Oh, I know, I want Bayan, I want Latosa, Ogumala. They were still generals under, under Ogumala, and Latosa too would later become a ballet at um, Ibadan. You know? And he was a big rising star in Ibadan, Bayan. One, one like a gun, because he was a very charismatic guy, very, very, very skilled warrior. How the war goes and things like that. And so, and Ibadan was a cosmopolitan city. Everybody that came there, if you can distinguish yourself as a warrior, you can rise to the top. You don't have to come from Oyo to, to rise to the top at Oyo. That, in fact, the only person that ever rose to the top at Oyo, for, that came from Oyo was Ibali Yoli. Look, every other person that you see that, was, that went to the very top leadership there, they, weren't, they didn't come from Oyo. You know, it was a place for Yoruba land. So, Kilo Shele Goko, the... Um, okay, then be at the, but don't she need fall out. Now, there was a, there was a rule at that time. The, the two military bases that had the mandate to, to go invade other places and, and regulate law and order all over Yoruba land were Ibado and, um, and, um, Ijaye. So, number T, Elisha Beresini, what Elisha Beres in Ija? No, I want to offer any expansion. So the the first one of the cities they set their eye on was Igbajo. Now Igbati won't offer war Igbajo yeah. Igbajo while Salo by bad. I pick bad wrong. Law work be king one majaki. Okay, just shall overrun one. So the Ibadan army set up and they they prepared to go to 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 Igbajo to defend it. Now, among the army that was sent there to defend that city was Ogedengbe and his war boys. So, as they got to the battlefield and the war was progressing, the the, the ethnic pride of the the inter-ethnic tribe of Ogedengbe rose up. Like, ah, wait, why would I be joining the battle to be killing my people? Right there and then on the battlefield, he switched from Ibadan side to Ijesha side, and he he started fighting his people. Uh, he started fighting the battle people. So, unfortunately, of course, Ijesha lost that war. For those of us, for those who know history, they, they knew how it ended. And so, one more co-host stages, one more more in northern, one more, okay, then be, but I was see bad for judgment. And now there's a law, because if you look at it, a lot of sabotage has cost um, Yoruba land a lot of wars. One of the reasons why they could not defeat, um, Ilorin many times was because of sabotage. Ilorin, you can call it Ilorin. You were joy, to I pay or your fair jaw gunye. Oh, let me even the the chocolate of caliphate or let me or your if or your was formidable and there was no fight. That time, once I pay king and cotty out the shame, what it caused a lot of division. I don't want to go into that because it's not a it's not something that is good to keep talking about. Anyway. So they brought um, Mogedengbe back to Ibadan and Bashar Gumala decided that this man must be executed. But because of his rising star and everything, they begged, they persuaded for him. One of the people that persuaded on his behalf was Latos, Latosa. Unfortunately, Latosa did not know that this man that he was begging for will be the, his major antagonist in the future when he became a leader himself. But of course, that's also another story. So they, they were able to save him from death, but of course his rising profile in Ibadan at that point became very dicey. 
you know that, that was a big act of sabotage to Ibadan interest so he left Ibadan and he went to to camp close to Elisha and so that was the first that was his first show of ethnic love for his people and that is one of the reasons that, that he is remembered for today that a, a great lover of his people a great lover of Ijesha. now another situation happened again that now really started the full full scale war between Ogedegbe and and Ibadan Ijesha became like a like a vassal state of Ibadan Tepe and Oluwan for Bajeni ni Lesha. They I want them for Baje almost everywhere in Yoruba land in my with an exception to maybe Jebu and Lagos. But even if I, to some point one one for Baje, you know, that's that's something a lot of people don't like to hear, but it was actually the truth, you know. At some point one for Baje no more gone in Lufe. You know. So Ogedengu was not happy that uh the his the sacred royal throne of Ijesha it has to be approved by Ibadan. It, it didn't make him happy at all. So now, in the late 1870s, I think it was 1870, the Yawa died and um, two princes vied for the throne. That was Ogedengbe, um, that was um, Odigba Digba and Owewe Niye. You know, so Odigba Digba was Kenny's choice. Well, no, no, I want your support, Joe. No, I want get them the, the military. I want support, but the I want chiefs that I want nobility. They supported the the other guy. Uh, so but he won't pay. I want me to do what's They now set up um getting base choice. Yes, um, that's um Odiba Diba. One work pa. They now set up the other guy on the throne. That was the final straw for for getting big. Ah, no, this must not go on. He now he brought in his his war boys and started really causing a lot of tension in Ijesha. They start, he started to riot, started to make the place ungovernable. So the uh, Ibadan now sent a, a a seasoned warlord. His name was Ajayi Oboriefon. They they sent him to to Elisha to to resolve the problem. So be your shit day Elisha. That's one of the greatest warlords of all times when you talk of Ibadan legends. So and one, he didn't want the fight to be in the city because he didn't want any damage to the city. So he knows the terrain very well, the bush area. So he went into the bush and stayed there. No, he knows about the battle tactics. So we will get the invasion trace along no, no bush. So he was using the Fabian strategy to fight Ogedengbe. He would just show up, do some damage, shoot, 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 kill, disappear. He bow Benyadada one more bit of my traces, you want more one more what you might get there. So he, he started doing that for a long time until he demoralized the Bori Efron's army. And he had to go back to Ibadan to to say that he could not capture um Ogedengbe. Now this was a very shameful thing for Boria Fon because before that time they've never lost a war. So it really it really saddened him. when he was even reporting this incident, he was they said he was crying. Maybe told Dunde this one of these young boys to be training all over shame in this kind of disgrace. But you know, that was where the war started with um Ogedengbe and and Ibadan. He would rather risk his life than you know, allow them to overrun his his land, his estate, his people, his heritage. He would rather die than do that. Now, this is what separates him from the people like the Balogun at Elori. But they won't, they won't sack on you. They were coming, invading on you, destroying on you, carrying on your people, selling them into slavery. These people did not think of, they didn't think of it as a bad thing. They didn't think of it as a shameful thing. So every Ibadan jaw should be one year, and they brought two leading powerful Balogons from Lorin to Ibadan. That was Latejo and Ajikobi, um, Balogun Ajikobi of Lorin. So one 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 Latejo Ibadan, Oluwa le Latejo Ibadan because Ibadan captured Oluwa. It was in his house that he stayed while they were passing judgment on him before they executed him in Lorin. And even Latejo himself, after that war, they raided. Um, 
some parts of Oyo took on the first wives of um, Oluyole and his children and sold them into slavery. Of course, this was Oluyole's chance for the revenge. They they sent the other one, Ajikobi, to Oyo to go and face um, um, Atiba. So, uh, by one say celebration of war, one of their celebration, I want Gazet to rebob, but she returned by Atiba. They come face the boy, see, see, Balogo called their shooter, what a path, they just killed him like that. Till today, nobody remembers them as heroes. You, you don't talk of all those Balogo in the lorry and have a nostalgic feeling of heroic things like you would when you think of, um, People like Oboriefo, people like Oluyole, people like Ogumala, people like Ibukunle, and of course, people like um, Ogedengbe. They're not remembered as heroes in Yoruba land. Why? Because they mortgaged their ethnic pride for ambitious reasons. They, they, they sold out. They were sellouts. They were, they were unpatriotic people. Okay, they will love the foundation set by our ancestors. Our ancestors did not want Yoruba land to be a centralized nation where... Um, somebody will have power over everybody else. Yeah, I don't believe that story that comes from Oyo, that Oyo was the capital of Yoruba land. It was never designed that way from inception. Every king was lord and master in his domain. Every king was a package Orisha. So, the, 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 the Jesha man is not, was not under Oyo. The Jebu man was not under Oyo. The Jebu kingdom, I mean. Um, all the initial kingdoms that um, what they do are set up. None of them, they were not designed to be centralized. The, the, the spiritual base was Ife, but each of the king was lord and master in his right. So, of course, when this is what Ogedengbe was fighting for, that don't come and cross that boundary. But he had no hatred at all towards Ibadan. And he had love for Yoruba land as a whole. That was why when Fabumi of Okemesi came to meet him and said, oh, um, we, let's do this Ekitiparapo war, Ekiti Anjisha, and you will be our leader. He was reluctant to take it because he had a lot of respect for Ibadan. His intention is not to cause any harm or, or set back for Ibadan. All he wanted was peace for his, um, for Jesha land. So even though he still took the leadership of that Ekiti Parapo war, Behind closed doors, he was doing everything to make peace with the Badon, sending the mysteries to them, you know. Even when the British came, they wanted to take advantage to, of the war to do, because the British and the Fulani, they have the same tactics. When they come in, they will see the tension in between you, then they will side the weaker person against the stronger person, so that, because they can't go after the stronger person directly. So immediately they use the weaker person to destroy the stronger person, they will now destroy both sides. So that was what happened when it came from Lauren. They decided that Fonja, who was the weaker person, against Oyo, the bigger picture, and then they used it to do divide and conquer. They did it in Nupe too. When the Etu of Nupe died and two princes were fighting for the throne, they sided the weaker one against the stronger one and then destroyed both of them after. So this is what the British too was trying to do. Um, they they wanted to side Ogedengbe and use him to now destroy Ibadan and then conquer everybody so that they can colonize. But Ogedengbe understood what was going on and he was really reluctant, super reluctant to, to accept that arrangement. You know, so they, they arranged from Lagos, got him some guns, they called it like Snyder Rifles. So they, 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 they designed those guns to conquer empires and it was supposed to be exclusive for British use. But because of the strategy, like, ah, we can let them kill themselves now. They gave those guns to Ogedengbe. And after he was using it to destroy, that was the first time he actually had advantage over Ibadan in the battle. And then they restricted it and made sure Ibadan didn't get access to those guns from Lagos. So those are all the situations that happened. But in between, Ogedengbe was doing his very best to make peace with Ibadan. But eventually, things didn't quite turn out. And as you see how it happened, after they used the Jesha to now destroy Ibadan, and silence everybody. They came in and took the whole um, Yoruba Empire, every every bit of Yoruba land, and then even the Ogedengbe okay, himself and Fabumi of Okomesi that they were supporting before, they arrested them and seized all those weapons from them. So that's also another story. I'm going into a lot of deviations and I'm going to stop. Now let's go back to the ethnic pride 
and tribalism compare like i said it's not the same thing and if you see that somebody likes nigeria it doesn't mean the person is not a tribalist the current president now is a super tribalist and that is why for the whole six years a dynamic nation as nigeria with all the all the potentials all the bright minds everything we've been doing for the past six years is talking about cows and headsmen that's the major the whole energy the whole politics of nigeria since they came to power is cattle rearing. They, no, other, no other situation, no other topic has bigger attention. Why? Because he's a tribalist and these are his people and he, he wants to protect the, 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 the heritage of the Fulani. So that should show us all that you, Zeke was a tribalist, even though people paint him as a, as a, as a nationalist and as a one that loved Nigeria more than his people. It was all a lie. He just felt like, see, let me tell you the story of Zeke. He schooled in Nigeria. Um, sorry, he schooled in America. And now he schooled at a time when the nationalism, um, um, Pan-Africanism was going on. And this man, Marcus Gave was asking, um, people to come back to Africa, but he wanted to create a kind of master race syndrome where some people are considered the bright minds dominating the other people and they tried that in liberia you know the families that control the liberia liberia is about one million people but a group of african americans they were returned from the united states they were no more than like forty thousand people then they were the ones now controlling the whole of liberia they are the ones that were in government they were the ones that are so they were not dominating the natives. They, they they acted like overlords over them. Now, this is what Zeke wanted in Nigeria. He wanted his people, Igbos, to be the master race over all the other people. So his fight and agitation for Nigeria as a whole was so that he can place his people as a master race. Of course, the thing backfired. Everything, when they were fighting for secession clause and he was saying no, and when they were saying let's have federalism and he was saying no 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 we want centralized government he was hoping that they would have that same structure as liberia and then Igbos would be the one in charge and you can see immediately that didn't happen because you see this the one year they were asking for they they changed the law to unitary system that was a run so it was an Igbo man that did it the whole country pro protested north protested west protested they didn't listen immediately the power left them they not only did they say they didn't want federalism again they actually now wanted confederation they wanted it totally reversed why because it, it uh, they can only ask for it they only want unitary system when it's an evil man in power and as you can know it was the people that helped ironsi to do those things in wokedi okibo um so all, they were all part of the Zeke movement. They were part of Zeke's agenda, part of Zeke, Zeke's vision. So they were the ones that still pushed on in the Ronsi's government. So that was the whole idea then. So being that someone loves Nigeria, it, it's usually for ambitious reasons. It, it doesn't necessarily mean they are more patriotic. No. So what Awolowo, for example, he, he, he had a lot of ethnic pride, but like I said earlier, ethnic pride is not the same as tribalism. Much as he loved his tribe, his, his, his ethnicity as, um, as a Yoruba man, his tribe as a Jebu, at no point did he rate Jebu over Yoruba land. In fact, most of his landmark achievements were in Ibadan. He made it up across the board. You can't, you can't really say this is something special he did for Jebu that he didn't do to other people. Also, he was the only one that was fighting for the case of minorities at that point. He was fighting the cause of the Middle Belt, cause of the South South. They loved him in the Middle Belt. When they created the UMBC under Joseph Taka, it was a coalition with AG. South South, oh, Mollis, Kensaruwa, and all of them, their agitations then, they were really in line. They were really in tune with um, with um, Awolowo. So his love for his people did not make him less of a Nigerian. He, he, he was the only one going to the north to campaign. 
got into campaign for the outside people because he didn't like the feudal system going on. He didn't like the way they were exploiting Hausa people, using them for full and political interest. And we all know how that turned out. You know, so many times the at the risk of his life campaigning in Shokoto, campaigning in all those places, he was loved in in Kanuri land. So. The, your the, your love for your tribe does not mean that you cannot reach out to people. You can't work with people. So it it just means that you respect each other as equals. So you can't say, um, I should not sacrifice my Yoruba heritage in the name of Nigeria because entoba fioria fawa konituro jenebe. Ethnic pride is very important. You and I need to proudly embrace it as Yoruba people. The ethnic tribe of Afro-Brazilians, the Cubans, the Caribbeans, it's not out of anything they have to do with Nigeria. It's out of the things they have to do with Yoruba. The spirituality, they embrace everything that they, they identify with. It has to do with Yoruba. Never trade that for Nigeria at all. If one needs to give away one thing for the other, it is Nigeria that should be given away for Yoruba heritage. From the very start, Nigeria was created for exploitation. First, it was the Europeans, now it's the elites, you know. So the only solution is embracing our ethnic pride. If we not do not go back to the blueprint of our ancestors that sets this, the foundations for Yoruba nation, we will one day wake up to become conquered citizens in our ancestral homes like the Hausa people.